Kia ora, and welcome to another video celebrating World Breastfeeding Week 2020. This is intended as a platform to share diverse experiences and information, and we hope that you find the series supportive and informative. It is important to note that these are personal stories and opinions, and do not necessarily reflect the views of Women's Health Action or our funders. Please seek advice from your health professional before making any important decisions about infant or young child feeding. Kia ora everyone and welcome back to another virtual Big Latch On video celebrating World Breastfeeding Week 2020. It's Caitlin here from Women's Health Action and today I'm joined by my lovely friend Lizzie. And Lizzie also works within the space of promoting breastfeeding and as you can see she's also a new mum. So today's video we're going to be chatting about the experiences of breastfeeding within those early days, sort of the first few months of forming a breastfeeding relationship and trying to fit breastfeeding into your daily life. And Lizzie's going to chat with us about that from her own current lived experience. So thank you so much for chatting with us, Lizzie. Do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, oh, look, this is what happens when you're Zooming in the kitchen. It's a whole family affair. We've got Peter here. Do you want to come up with yourself as well, Peter? Kia ora. About ourselves. I'm Lizzie and um, we live here in Stanmore Bay, which is about 45 minutes north of um, Auckland City. And well, depending on traffic. Um, and I'm one of five kids, so I come from a really big family, mostly girls. <laughs> a lot of a lot of women. There's a lot of um, a lot of female energy in our household um, and lots of nieces and a few nephews now too. Um, I grew up in Auckland. My mum's whanau from um, Te Tai Tokiro, so she was born in Kaio and then grew up in Waipapa. Um, her, she, we all fuck on her line. We fuck up to um, Tingairi Bay, which is forty-five minutes from Kitty Kitty near Matodi Bay. Um, and on my papa's side, to Carl. Um, and on my dad's side, he's everything Pakia. So all of those, um, <laughs> all of those countries in the UK, essentially. <laughs> Scottish. My papa, uh, my dad's dad is. English and um, I think there might be some Welsh in there too but I don't really know my dad's my dad's whakapapa very well um, and yeah we um, we became parents in May this year we had a little Gemini baby <laughs> called uh, Hiwi Te Rangi. she was born on the 26th and so yeah we're about nine weeks into this new job promotion. <laughs> nice and of course you've been breastfeeding. Yes. <laughs> Do you want to tell us a little bit about your um, your experiences that you've had so far? Yeah, where do I start? Um, so we had her at home, we had a home birth and it was really beautiful. I kind of didn't I, I mean, I, I knew from being at my sister's births and stuff that babies quite intuitively knew how to latch on and feed, but it nevertheless was really um, amazing, A, eh? when she was like 10 minutes out, it was crazy, eh? Like within 10 minutes of her being out, like she just kind of latched on so easily you do, kind of didn't have to teach her. It was more me that needed to be taught. She knew what she was doing. It was me that was struggling, really. Um, but we went to the to a birthing unit after that for some support, and they were really great with breastfeeding, actually. They were really, really good. But nevertheless, I think it was still a few really minor technique issues that made it really, really painful and difficult. Like, I mean... I was like bleeding. That was so raw. And when and when my milk came in, I felt like Dolly Parton. My boobs were huge, and um, and it was just really uncomfortable. Like I couldn't even sleep sideways because the pain just from the side of my boobs was so sore. Um, 
and it really got to the point where I was resenting breastfeeding actually quite recently even um, and I would dread feeding her because it was just so hideous um, and I was really lucky that I had a really supportive midwife that just kind of let me guide the trajectory of that experience rather than kind of impose these rules onto me and ideas onto me. Um, one of the midwives in the birthing unit asked if I wanted to use a shield because she was like, your nipples look disgusting. Um, they looked bad. So she kind of, put, they kind of are like, yeah, like coverings almost. They look like top of a bottle, like you would a breastfeed through a bottle, a feed through a bottle. It looks like a teat. And that actually helped in the first few weeks just on one side, just while it healed, because it was really cracked and sore. So that was a really great tool that helped. Um, now we don't use anything, we're about eight weeks in and she doesn't need anything and I don't either. So yeah, there were quite a few challenges and there were so many times where I was like, what the fuck am I doing this? Like, please remind me again why I'm doing this. And, um, Around that time, like my my milk was in definitely by about a few weeks. It was definitely in, but by the end of the day, she was still really, really hungry, like screaming the house down, which isn't unusual. But when it's your first time going through it, it is quite overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And um, and we got this pump called a haka pump. We went out and got it like this, and it's like a manual suction type thing that you put on one of your boobs while you're feeding off the other and it catches the let down and it didn't cost much it was, it's a New Zealand company Harker, and it cost about 30 yeah 30 29 bucks and with all of the let down um that it was cat I used to get about I don't know up to 100 mils a day probably not that much maybe yeah um in that first one or two weeks and Peter would give her a bottle at night just to kind of top her up and fill her up. Um, and the first night that he did that, she slept for like six hours. Wow. I was like, Shit. yeah, I was like, Shit, I'm hungry. <laughs> so I slept every day, but it became really debilitating because you'd wake up, I'd wake up with the stress and anxiety of needing to get enough extra milk to give to her. Mm -hmm. at night and just like that mental load of how much will I get and the more that I stressed about it I'm sure that I would have produced less because of it um and obviously as she continued to grow she continued to need more milk and I just that doesn't increase your supply at all it's not an electric pump it just catches the letdown so I, I wasn't getting over and above and she was needing more than I was able to give um able to give so I was like this is unsustainable we can't keep doing this because now she'll have like 150 mils in a feed you know she's giving mm. four times um and I went online I mean I work in research so like I knew that there were benefits to breastfeeding and especially the colostrum like I knew that that was quite critical but in terms of the long-term trajectory of those babies who are breastfed versus not I was like you know what is the real impact because lots of babies in my whanau have been breastfed and lots have been bottle fed I was fully bottle fed um but that was out of circumstance because my mum wasn't alive so I'm sure if she was she would have but when I compare myself to my brothers and sisters I really can't see any mm -hmm noticeable differences so I really didn't understand and so I went on it was really hard to understand from the evidence that I was reading what the really stark positive benefits were in the long term I mean I know that there are like gastro related infections that babies are less likely to get if they're breastfeed um in some kind of gynecological cancer I feel like but these are all kind of random obscure things um and all of the studies that I read were observational they weren't randomized control trials and so from that I was like well this could just be a reflection of the sample because 
I feel like breastfeeding now has become a marker of privilege um, and people who are attracted to those studies had more wealth, they had more access to participate in this project. So is being able to breastfeed and all of those other positive benefits that the study has proposed a reflection of that wider environmental circumstance rather than the breastfeeding itself. So really, I mean, I came to the conclusion that I don't even know why, like what I'm, you know, why am I still in it? Um, and so I said to my midwife, she knew that I was considering formula feeding and I talked to all of my aunties and stuff about it. And interestingly enough, it was my aunties and my family that pushed for it the most, <laughs> not my sisters or anything. It was like those a generation above me because how stressed I was and they all bottle fed and I'm like, oh, this isn't even worth it. You know, like it's not worth the stress. And so I said to my midwife, um, you know, she goes, where are you? What are you thinking now? And I said, I want to give her a bottle at night. I'm just thinking about giving her a bottle of formula because I can't sustain this pumping situation. And she just goes, oh, good on you. And I was really nervous to tell her actually because I thought, oh, she's a midwife. Pushing her breast is best to gender on me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and she wasn't trying to say good on you as if like encouraging it, but just kind of encouraging me for making my own decisions really. Mm. And she goes, you would be surprised how many women lie to me when I come over for visits and they'll, I'll be asking, you know, how's feeding going? And they'll say, oh, it's going fantastic. It's going great. And she can see formula tins and bottles lining up on the kitchen bench, but they're pretending that they're, and she goes, I can see. They kind of go, oh, yeah, you know, I'm really sorry. I just am finding it really hard. And she goes, you don't have to lie to me, but I can totally see why people lie to midwives. <laughs> because really, all throughout being pregnant and up until this point, all the information I've been given is on breastfeeding and how breastfeeding is so great. And it is like now that I've gotten past the pain and the stress and whatever it's perfectly fine like I really enjoy it now but I think the fact that we're only given information on how great breastfeeding is negates the experience of those who can't mm -hmm. or those who want to and I mean I was at a wananga when I was pregnant so we went to um, hapu wananga instead of antenatal classes and I loved it. The facilitator spent maybe an hour talking about the benefits of breastfeeding. And this wananga was attended by not only people who are hapu like me, but those who have had babies. So babies up to one with the air, even older. And there was one girl who I've, I'm now friends with who had a baby that would have been about six months at the time. And she was making formula for him, bottles of formula when he needed it. And I remember thinking, wow, this girl is so strong for like sitting through this conversation where all we're being told is why you have to breastfeed and why it's so much better. And I didn't know what her experience was and why she was bottle feeding. But, um, you know, I remember thinking she must be so tough to kind of withstand this conversation without kind of letting it get to her because I think there's a lot of guilt around breastfeeding versus bottle feeding. Um, yeah, so long story short, we went to we went to give her formula at night, just one bottle of bed, dream feed, and she's sleeping through the night. Like I told you before, she slept until 7 a.m. this morning. And like thinking about our entire Fano, rather than just focusing on the baby, because I feel like that's quite a pakia way of looking at it. Looking at our entire Fano in terms of the breastfeeding experience, giving her formula has meant that we're sleeping longer and we are so much happier because of it. And I feel like we're such better parents than we would be if I was up every three hours feeding her breast milk. Um, yeah, so we've been mixed feeding for about a month now. And it's going really well, really, really well. I do think, though, I was talking to some friends about this recently 
who have kids and are Māori like us, there is a lot more expectation on Māori women to breastfeed. Mm. And I didn't realise really until I've been in it. But those who push for it the most were Māori. Peter, my partner, I mean, he can share his experience with you. But, um, but a lot of wives, the like Fano, Wananga facilitators, the lactation consultants I know that are Māori, they are all so pro breast and they're cool, but like the reality of Māori women breastfeeding is so much more than just wanting to be able to do it. So many of us aren't because we have to go back to work within a few weeks of having a baby. I mean, I was telling you about my boss. She's incredible and she's got five kids. She just had twins and she went back to work I mean I feel like she doesn't stop working but like for someone like her who's raising kids while working those realities must be so different to someone like me who is able to have the choice of being at home or not um so yeah I feel like what we really what I really would have appreciated was different stories about breastfeeding from those who are Ma- of feeding sorry not just breastfeeding but different trajectories and realities of those who are Māori feeding their babies because um I think normalizing whatever works for you is mm. positive yeah and being able to see yourself through those stories is also really positive mm. I think it's kind of removing the binary of it's either fully breastfed or you failed you know it's yeah and also it's like I feel like now because I give her formula before Peter gives her formula before bed the likelihood of me being able to continue feed at breastfeeding and breastfeeding for longer even though it's mixed is probably going to happen like I'll probably end up breastfeeding her for longer because it feels much more sustainable than feeding her every three hours. Yeah, I think that's something that's been coming out a lot from these interviews is that there's no one right way to feed. Everybody's been able to build it into their life in different and valid ways. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I do think though that no matter when I stop breastfeeding, I'm probably still going to feel really bad. And I don't know why, like even if I were to stop within a few weeks, or a year or however long I feel, I don't know why, but I just can imagine it'll that's something I have to deal with when it comes to it. okay so we've got Peter who's Lizzie's partner and he's going to share a little bit from his perspective around breastfeeding so I think like over that first kind of first few days there's not really much that you can do as a partner um besides take baby away and let or busy mum sleep um even if it's only for like an hour or two um like those first three days are um quite draining um and but seeing um like how excited lizzie was when like her milk first started coming through um and being like oh you know i've done it like that's like I, I can do this and then um I don't know if I was as supportive as I probably should have been but um and and verbalizing how proud I was but um I definitely was and it's just such a beautiful thing to see that relationship develop and I mean um probably the first four weeks um as you kind of figure things out um we had Lizzie um expressing into a bottle and then me giving um he were top ups at night before bed with, with breast milk um but that wasn't kind of senior through the night and i don't know how long through till we jumped on um formula we probably got through to maybe like a month yeah maybe four weeks to five weeks and it was just becoming too hard where um baby was waking up lots during the night um, and like her feeds at night weren't enough. So 
Um, I got sent down. <laughs> I got sent down to the um, countdown at about uh, nine fifty at night, and it's a, a ten minute house. So I got there at nine fifty nine, ran through the door, um, and picked up our first tin of formula, and and then gave baby a drink, like a, 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 a um, formula bottle, and that seems kind of solve at least for our, like in our experience, um, made nights a, a lot easier. Um, and slowly the dream feeds are beginning getting later and later and last night she slept through uh was eight o'clock all the way through to seven o'clock this morning mm. um pretty much uninterrupted that was just with me giving her a dream feed at 11 o'clock um, what did you think about introducing formula um i was not really supportive um and making shift formula like i was in um Liz, you might have said this already, but um, my preference was to keep it all natural and, and breastfeed. Um, and I was really resistant to um, to getting formula and, and, and I guess um, thinking about what uh, my mum or others would think about um, baby being um, breastfed. So... Um, uh, not breastfed, sorry, um, like having that formula top up. Um, and in hindsight, I'm just like, well, I don't really give, and this is my attitude for most things, is I just don't really give a shit what other people <laughs> think. <laughs> um, I mean, every baby's different. Um, every mother's different. Every situation is different. And, and we've got to appreciate that. And um, just finding that, finding something that works for you um, and your baby. I mean, she's putting on, she's put on so much weight. She's healthy. She's happy. Um, you know, I kind of wish we had introduced it a bit sooner. So Lizzie didn't have to, um, go through such mental strain. Like, uh, yeah, yeah I think it was a very really tough time for Lizzie. Um, cause there's, there's literally nothing I can do besides take baby away. Mm. Um, and give her like a break. Mm -hmm. um, so I kind of wish we had a border in um, a bit earlier for, for Lizzie's mental health, I guess. Um, but I mean, she was a parent and pushed through anyway. Um, I like doing these interviews. I hear all the stuff that he doesn't tell me in real life. I'm like, oh, he just frowns with me. <laughs> like my, well, not my favourite thing, but. My favourite thing to do with here was like pick her up when she's first in the morning, uh, like first thing in the morning when she's happy, and then just bring her into bed with me and have a cuddle. But um, like that second um, slot that allows me to um, get like a nice bond with her, that south thing is is giving her those dream feeds. So that yeah. time when she um, when I give her the bottle, like I'm that's our time together, and um, like something that we get to do and. Um, you know, it's 11 o'clock, 10, 11 o'clock at night and she's asleep. But it's just a nice time because it's quiet. It's just you two. Um, yeah. And I mean, like, that's time, times that I really cherish. Mm. Um, yeah. Like, as guys, we don't really get to see this, that male perspective on, like, what role we play. Yeah. Um, like, besides breadwinner. Mm. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to think about like the only people that I really got to talk to about that were was like one of my mates and only kids is you know, three. Mm -hmm. Um, but for like new fathers that, that might not necessarily have that friend that's had kids already. Kids already. Yeah, what does that support anyway. look like when you don't really know or you don't really have anyone to talk about it with? Yeah, hi down. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> It's going well now and I mean as infuriating as it was hearing from my friends I promised it'll get easier I promised it easier I was just like fuck off because I I just really thought I'm it's going to be like this forever mm. um and it got an easier but that's only because I had access to help like I ended up seeing a lactation consultant for Plunkett um who helped with kind of technique and I think it was that in combination with my boobs just toughening up like yeah they 
it, it was really, it took a while to get there. But actually, it wasn't really the love. This probably isn't all that romantic, but it wasn't the love of me wanting to breastfeed that got me, me through it. It was just that I had internalized pressure long enough to stay in it. <laughs> like, it's like, like, I've got to do it because everyone's going to think, like, I'm some shit mother if I don't. And that's the truth of it, actually. Um, which sounds ridiculous now. And it's interesting that I never held those perspectives for other people. I mean, I've got lots of friends that bottle feed. My cousins, I didn't even think about it, really, when they had bottles. But all of a sudden, like, when I was in that position myself, I felt differently, and I don't know where that pressure came from. Um, but, yeah. Mm. Anyway, we got we got there in the end, and now that my supply has settled, it's way easier to breastfeed, not worrying about whether or not she's getting enough. Look what you're sad about. Are you hungry? Should I show you guys my beautiful child before we finish out? <laughs> Look. Oh. Oh. You're on the Look at the chin. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. We shouldn't objectify our children. <laughs> yeah, I'm really happy to hear that you managed to get there in the end and now you're happy with how things are going. Yeah. Yeah, but still acknowledging that it, it is challenging and, yeah, that's just the reality that you've experienced. Yes. Yeah. And also, to whoever's listening that's feeling like, you know, I don't know what to do. I think inside yourself, you know what to do. It's just about like finding support to go down that path. Yeah. Just to be strong. And whatever you decide. Oh, thank you so much for talking with us, Lizzie. I think you might need All to. Good. <laughs> he will want some yeah. now. <laughs> okay. Yeah, thank you. This was really helpful. All good. Cool. Okay, See bye.